Hey, this is a familiar looking group. Oh, Tyler. Hello. How's it going? Good. Good. Excellent. Yeah, let's see. I was just looking over who else here. Yeah. Alex and Grandma. And let's see, that ought to put us right about everybody. Let's see. Yeah, if you're not here, raise your hand. Uh, <laughs> okay, yeah, really. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, this is going to be a little crazy having this right after quantum, but, you know, maybe we can be a little more relaxed. Uh, so what does your time look like, everybody? Uh, do you have time after this? Who's, who's going to be pressed after this class to get uh, I will be. I, I, teach, will. I teach labs at 1.30. 1.30, okay. Yeah. yeah. I have a, another class at 1.30. Okay, is that true Monday and Wednesday? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, all right. Um, yeah, it's be nice if we could be leisurely, but uh, we'll try to, try to keep it in time and do the rest uh, as needed. Okay, so uh, we need to all get on the same page, I think. And the, the first page is actually the first seven chapters of the gauge theory book from this summer. All right, now, um, yeah, I, I want to be able to assume that you guys already know a bunch. Uh, how many of you had Charlie's class last semester on classical field theory? Uh, did you all have it? We all do. Yeah. You all did. Okay, good. So, so I don't have to go to a discrete model of springs and say, hey, you got enough of these little balls and little springs and it looks like a field, right? You, you guys know what a field is. Um, and it uh, probably saves me spending a whole bunch of time reminding you how to write, uh, well, you know, electromagnetism as a field theory, uh, relativistic field theory. Uh, you know, so you'll all know Klein-Gordon, complex Klein-Gordon. Uh, right. We might want to spend a little extra time on the Dirac field. How, how are you feeling about the Dirac field? Is that... Uh, uh, we spend a good time on it, I think. Yeah. Okay, so um, the Dirac matrices, you've, you've written a uh, basis of solutions and a, a full uh, free field solution for it? Or no? I'm not hearing an answer. <laughs> um, so if I asked you to write down the general solution to the vacuum uh, Dirac equation, would you know just what to do or uh, have you it all? Probably take a look at it again, probably. <laughs> yeah, like a refresher. Okay. Yeah, yeah that's about yeah. it. Well, sure, okay. So, so we'll do that. And yeah, there'll be more refresher. Uh, so uh, let's see. On the, I think I've got this on the canvas site already. Um, has anybody looked? Uh, this, um, wait a minute. Um, I don't. I don't remember what I've posted to. You put yeah, you the, the. You have the two books. Um, and I yeah. Okay. I've, I've I've linked I've linked the books and let's see. Have I linked any notes yet? Let's see the. The books are both evolving. Um, more, more the, uh, more the uh, field theory book. The the field theory book I've got is is that online now? Is that linked? The quantum field theory. Okay, yeah. that's a very old version. Uh, if, if you if you look at the, you know, you'll you'll see that every equation is numbered in that. That's because I was just learning to use LaTeX and I was copying and pasting everything. So that's how old those notes are. So I'm doing a pretty substantial revision of those notes and I'll, I'll, I'll replace those uh, with a date, I guess it's just the best way to do it. And, you know, and, you know, I'll sort of be up through pages, blah, blah, blah. Um, so of the topics in the gauge theory book, you know, I, I should probably open this up now myself. 
Uh, give me just a second here to, to get this. Um, all right, where is it? Yeah, yeah, there we go. All right, so there's the field theory book, but yeah, okay, what I really want to look at first is the gauge theory book. Um, so let me find that one, gauge theory, here we go. Um, so, all right, these topics, um, okay, first, special relativity, like most of you guys are relativists or something, right? You. Uh, are you guys good at general relativity? Uh, it, who define good? You define good. You let's say you've had a course in general relativity. Uh, We're all taking one, and I think most of us have seen a lot of it on our own. Yeah, that's that's my feeling. So you know, it's it's studying general relativity that makes special relativity make sense. So you know, so special relativity will probably make sense to you. Uh, so you're probably all fine with that. Let's see, uh, manifolds we won't be looking at particularly in here unless uh, unless we get off into string theory at some point, which you know may take us beyond the amount of time we've got available. How about differential forms? Um, you good on that? All right. So you know I have notes in the gauge theory book, uh, you know of uh, that. Uh, review all the basic things you can do with differential forms. Um, the use of differential forms in quantum field theory, you know, it's mostly one forms, you know, just writing gauge fields is more convenient that way. The, the field strength will be a two form, but um, uh, fairly straightforward applications of those. Uh, let's see. I don't know, I might show you the gauge theory, but we'll see. Okay, so next, Lie groups and Lie algebras. You're, you're all nodding. Uh, no, I'm seeing I'm seeing a, a no here. And a, uh, Kevin and Lyle, how are you? you you're, you're uh, good. I'm, I'm, I'm probably middle of the road. Okay. I'm good on the Lie algebras. Yeah. Okay. So um, you know when we're missing in with the lead derivative stuff. Yeah. Yeah, lead derivative, not so much. You'll probably see that in, in general relativity. But um, yeah, what, uh, what, what we're going to need, you know, for the standard model, we need SU3, SU2, U1, right? So if you're OK with the unitary groups, you know, it's probably not too much of a lead. But in the gauge theory book, I've got two chapters on lead groups, uh, one uh, on the general properties and one with a number of examples. And among the examples, let's see, I've got, uh, I do SU2 in detail. Um, I do SL2C. Uh, and then I, I do the general case of spin PQ. Um, and that's the one that we need for the Dirac equation. Uh, but uh, let me just say, up front for every orthogonal group, all right? So basically the rotation group in, in dimensions, or if you have some uh, um, indefinite metric uh, in, you know, P positive and Q positive uh, signs on, on your diagonalized flat space metric, um, the, the rotation, uh, you know, as a combination of rotates, rotations and boosts for those spaces, but it's just cinch and cosh instead of sine and cosine. But all those groups really look the same. Their Lie algebras are basically identical. Um, as long as you stick the metrics in the right place, uh, these all look the same, SOPQ. The special orthogonal group in P positive, Q negative, you know, Q time-like, P space-like dimensions. Um, each of those groups has a two to one cover by a spin group. So for SOPQ, there is spin PQ. And uh, that's, con that's found by constructing a, uh, a Clifford algebra, 
uh, the, that's the anti-commutation relations for the gamma matrices. And um, we should probably do some exercises with the gamma matrices. Uh, you need to be able to take, say, the, the trace of a product of eight gamma matrices, you know, to do a basic scattering problem in QED, uh, you end up, you know, writing out all these factors and you know, doing some manipulations that end up making it a trace to get a transition amplitude. All this happens inside some path integral thing, but, you know, one term like this will correspond to, you know, a, a few Feynman diagrams. Uh, things are falling from the sky here. Uh, the, uh, uh, um, so the procedure for actually computing a transition amplitude where you have photons and uh, electrons interacting is, you know, involves taking traces of products of a bunch of gamma matrices and then keeping track of some really long expressions that will not fit on this board. And <laughs> all right, all right, uh, all right. You haven't, you haven't all met Rosalind, but. Um, yeah, just for context here, let's see. Well, most of you have. Uh, yeah, Tyler, you you probably haven't yet, but yeah, my situation here, I'm at home. That's my whiteboard. Uh, I'm standing on a treadmill that I don't run during class, but this cat loves to be, it, she'll walk with me on the treadmill if I run it slowly enough. <laughs> it's, uh, her name is Rosalind and she likes to come visit when I'm here. So. You know, see her now and then. You know, if you see me looking down at my feet, that's just probably rubbing against my legs. So awesome. Uh, let's see. So we were talking about Clifford algebras. All right. So that last section of chapter five in the gauge theory book, um, if everything else there looks familiar, uh, I should give that a study. Uh, then chapter six is functional analysis. Uh, we're going to be doing some things with path integrals and uh, that, um, uh, well, you might, you might take a look through uh, functional integration development of the Feynman path integral. Um, at this point, there are techniques for getting things out of them without actually trying to integrate over a whole bunch of paths. Uh, depending actually on what, uh, which of the fundamental interactions say you're interested in. You know, if you're doing uh, electroweak work, then the, the projection, the, the predictions uh, can, be, can be gotten by doing um, path integrals perturbatively. The, the basic technique with the path integral is to, um, to separate, no, let, let me write down what, I'm looking, what we're looking at here, just a sec. Uh, yeah, the, the development that I do for the Wiener path integral and the Feynman path integral uh, is basically getting uh, starting from quantum mechanics and uh, generating a, an expression as a functional integral for uh, a transition amplitude from some initial state to some final state. And that's, that's the inner product of some bra and ket. You square that thing and you're making a prediction. But the, the general form is uh, an integral over, well, uh, it's quantum field theory, so let's say a field, but then e to the i over the action, and then the action functional up here uh, depends on whatever whatever fields you're interested in. Well, this is divided up into uh, a um, a free field part and a potential, and uh, basically you know how to solve the free field part. We can write down quantized free fields on flat space. And actually in, in a fixed curve space background, you can 
right, if you prefix. But then the exponential for the potential, uh, you write a Taylor series for this. And if that potential is small, uh, that series, um, well, converges for a while. Yeah, in, in fact, um, to evaluate uh, term by term in that series, what, what happens is, uh, right, you, um, you get terms that are higher and higher in the potential and they involve, they involve integrals uh, over pretty much everything. So uh, if the potential is small, you, you have a consistent perturbative theory. And let's see, each, at each order in the potential, there are certain, uh, well, Feynman diagrams you can draw. So one thing we'll see is the way that uh, the Dirac equation, uh, now here, let me, let me write the Dirac equation. So, so suppose we're working with the Dirac, does this look familiar when I write it this way? You've seen that, okay. So the slash means I'm contracting with the gamma matrices, the Dirac matrices, and um, just shout if you've got questions. But uh, now when we, when we couple this to electromagnetism, uh, we write ID slash minus a vector potential minus M psi. And, and then you, you have field equations for the vector potential as well, where, um, okay, you've got uh, d mu, f d mu. That's, that's a current, but we no longer have such thing as a phenomenological current. The currents are the currents of the other fields in the theory. It's a fundamental theory. So what we have over here is the, the current from the direct, what's the direct current look like? I think it's something like uh, psi bar gamma mu psi times some, well, some, some stuff here. Uh, but the conserved direct current um, looks pretty, yeah, I think that's, that's actually it. And the, uh, the, the thing that we're interested in here is the interaction. And the interaction happens right here. You've got this a slash psi term that. Uh, Doctor, would you tilt the screen down, please? Yeah. Oh, yep. Yeah. Uh, wrong screen there. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Uh, good. Yeah. So uh, where you get the coupling to the vector potential, where you have a product of different fields, that's called an interaction term. Without that, that's the free Dirac field. So this division of the path integral into the free field plus potential, you have a free Dirac field and then you have this coupling and this is what you expand. This has a coefficient of something like the fine structure constant associated with it. One over approximately 137 is a small number. So you've got what normally would be a very strongly convergent series. But here's, here's what happens. Uh, let's see, I can I'll draw some up here. So <clears throat> you, you write diagrams where, okay, you've, you've got your initial state coming in and uh, this sort of interaction term happens at a point where you actually have a conjunction of three fields. So um, uh, you get the, uh, Psi bar going out here. Yeah, in, in the action, in the action, there'd be a psi bar uh, on this. So it's it's really a term like psi bar with some constant here. Uh, a product of three fields, an incoming field, an outgoing field, and uh, a, a photon field that interact at a point. So what you do when you evaluate this path integral, and it's no longer a path integral, it's a, it's a sum over histories, uh, is a better way to say it. It is, uh, you, you sum over all field configurations. 
So what that ends up meaning in our diagram here is that uh, you, you draw this diagram, you assign momenta and so on. You, there's a certain vertex operator, basically the gamma in that A slash that happens here with a fine structure constant that tells the probability for that event to happen. And you integrate that over all positions and all momenta. So you're gonna, you really are gonna end up summing up all of these different things uh, for, for a piece of a diagram like this. Now this can't be a complete diagram. You would normally be talking about uh, some, other, some other particle coming in and going out like this. So this, this would be, you know, this could be an electron and a proton uh, scattering. And at this lowest level, you can reproduce uh, the Coulomb interaction, um, for example. So what, what happens, uh, there's one of the things that makes it very difficult to, to get out any kinds of answers is that uh, in this perturbative series, the, the number of these vertices is equal to the, the order of this potential. This is the interaction term. So you have this power series in integrals over products of V. And you know, by the time you get up to several factors of V, that means that uh, each time you have a V, you can add another uh, interaction point. So if we had three Vs, we could have uh, another exchange like this and have a photon in the final state maybe. Or if, we're, if we don't have any outgoing particles in the final state, by the time we get four, we could, we could exchange two photons. Or, you know, the thing is you have to take into account everything that could happen. So one thing that can happen is you emit a photon, that photon could pair produce an electron positron pair. So you've got an electron coming in, an electron going out, and uh, they annihilate and then interact with your other particles. So say we're doing electron-electron scattering. In a sense, that's a simple problem. But now when we have four what are called vertices, uh, we could draw pictures like this too. So we, we start to get more and more different pictures. And basically the rule is anything that can happen will. So you're allowed to take this, this little thing, two, two solid lines and a wavy line, and you're allowed to stick those in four different places and you have to have the same things in and the same things out. But there's another diagram where that electron goes here and that electron goes here. That has to be added in because electrons are indistinguishable particles. So, uh, so you have to add two terms. So if, if we're evaluating one or order in this perturbative series, there could be several different diagrams that we all have to add, add, have to add together to come up with a prediction um, for the probability amplitude for this going to that. And that's basically what we're after all the time. Okay, so what's the problem here? I'm sorry to question. Yes, yes, Alex. Sorry. When you said uh, when you said the power of V, are you talking like like what what's the power dimension? Like you're not you're not expanding E, you're saying uh, like uh, V uh, is a function uh, of yeah, Taylor series for this exponential. Okay, so you, so so yeah, you you are saying that it's term-wise series expanding out the 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 phase factor or whatever. That's right. Now remember, this is you know this is the action. This is an integral here. So um, term by term, you're going to get a product of several integrals. You know, with these and these have to be time ordered. I mean, there's a lot of detailed stuff we're going to have to talk about to to make this precise. But yeah, it's. Is straight out Taylor series of this paying attention to operator ordering. So now uh, the thing that happens is the number of topologies goes up faster than the convergence of the series. 
So you're, each time you're getting powers of the fine structure constant. So that converges fast, but the number of diagrams goes up faster than n to the n, right? It is faster than an exponential. And so what you get when you do even QED, quantum electrodynamics, is a, an asymptotically uh, uh, convergent series. You know, uh, for, the, for the first several terms, it gets better and better and better, but you know, eventually it's gonna, it's gonna diverge on you. So even, even in something with a small coupling constant, the, the path integral technique, um, while it can give you 12 significant figures uh, that are born out by experiment, <laughs> that's some experiment, eh? Um, it's not, uh, it, you know, it's not perfect. It's not gonna give you exact answers. Uh, what, uh, what replaces that, and most especially with the strong interaction, is uh, um, lattice QCD. So in QCD, quantum chromodynamics, the, the coupling constant is of the order of one in, instead of the fine structure constant, which is very small, you, you know, your perturbative series doesn't be any good. It doesn't, it doesn't converge at all. So uh, what you do instead is you imagine dividing space time up into a lattice. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, it's four by four by four by four uh, or six by six by six by six. You know, you, you end up assigning lattice points. I don't know how big they are, you know, they're probably a hundred to the fourth now, they're probably huge now. Um, but uh, you, you break space time up into a, a finite number of points. And now you actually compute the path, you know, the exponential of the action along each path in that finite lattice. Now, each lattice point or each uh, line connecting lattice points um, has a lot of information, you know, quite a, quite a list of properties, momenta and, and so forth for each particle or interactions or whatever. Uh, so lots can happen at each uh, vertex as you do that. And so, you know, let's see back, uh, well, uh, yeah, my best friend in grad school uh, did his thesis looking at um, uh, four by four by four by four, six by six by six by six and eight to the fourth. I think he was able to do eight uh, lattice lattice points per di per direction. So, you know, like six, uh, 36 was 36 squared is, you know, big. Um, you've got that many lattice points in space time. And he was comparing edge effects. You know, you're truncating things or putting on periodic boundary conditions or something when you do when you do these problems, probably periodic boundary conditions. And so, you know, you're gonna get some error because of that approximation. And he was trying to assess the error in that size. Well, you can imagine the uh, improvement in computers between that would have been the mid eighties and now, uh, you, know, <laughs> the, um, you know, we can now um, use such a lattice calculation this is lattice QCD we're talking about, quantum chromodynamics. Uh, you know, to, well, I know we're within 10% of a prediction of the mass of the proton uh, by looking at quark interactions. We can, we can partition the, uh, uh, we build the model of the proton by three interacting quarks. It turns out that about half of what's going on in the quark, what's what's the uh, what's the particle that quarks exchange? You, you guys know your basic uh, gluons. Yeah. Gluons, yeah, yeah, they're curly lines, little pig, pigtail kinds of things. Okay, so um, yeah, uh, that's how they actually look, right? Like pigtails. It is, yes, actually, yes, um, yes. Uh, Trump has taken some beautiful pictures of these pigtail shapes that. Uh, by the way, we do have a new president now. Uh, just thought you ought to know. Um, the, uh, 
Yes, yes. Gluons are actually these little spiral spring type things that connect up the quarks like this. Uh, you know, actually, um, there was a model. Uh, people were trying to understand mesons, which are simpler than the proton. That's a quark anti quark pair. Do you guys know this basic stuff about particles? You, you're pretty good with that. Okay. So, you know, just ask if I say something that sounds like gobbledygook and isn't not counting the spring thing. Uh, but, okay, so you've, you've got a quark and an anti-quark and the strong force between them. Well, a, um, a, a sort of quasi-classical picture of that tells you that if you had lines of force, they would all be this way. You know, you have a few and kind of a dipole configuration, but your lines of force are gonna be sort of all lying along a line like this. And so, <clears throat> Uh, in the, um, let's see, well, who was it, Nambu, uh, thought in the early, late 60s that you might come up with a, a prediction of the meson spectrum by treating this as a bit of string with uh, charges on the end of the string. And so he and uh, uh, Goto, wrote down an action. Uh, what they took for the action was, okay, you've got this string-like thing that uh, moves along in space-time sweeping out a world sheet. Okay, a world line, but now you're, you have all strings and so now you have a world sheet. And they took the area of that world sheet as, as the Lagrangian and, you know, integrated over the Lagrangian and found an extreme. And it gives you a wave equation on a string. So, you know, you have all these wave modes on uh, possible, you know, this thing's got some tension because the uh, this could be spinning end for end and um, pull. So you can set up various different wave to wave modes depending on the energy of this thing. And they analyzed the spectrum and uh, were disappointed because it had a a massless spin two mode. Um, the mesons are all spin one particles. You've got two two fermions that can uh, uh, produce spin one, but that string has spin two mode. Oh, hush, not you. <laughs> the cat wants attention. But the other thing she does is she fetches. So uh, these days, it used to be uh, little super balls, but these days it's, it's an eyedropper. And so she'll bring an eyedropper over and drop it at my feet and meow at me. And I throw it across the room and She'll run and get it and trot back with the eyedropper in her mouth, drop it at my feet again. And I, we seem to have accidentally gotten dogs. <laughs> but this, this, uh, she, this, this is where she gets a lot of attention when I'm trying to do work at my computer. Uh, the gluon is, is that a spin zero part? Um, I guess virtual particle maybe? I forgot uh, the- Okay, so- the glue on is a work of all those. Thanks for bringing us back on track here. Uh, yes, uh, glue on is spin one. Uh, gauge particles. Uh, uh, the glue on is an example of uh, an SU3 gauge field, and as such, is a spin one particle. Um, when when you do a gauge theory, uh, you do realize what I was talking about, before, right? That was the first string theory, and Schurk and Schwartz, I'll get back to your question, Guillermo. Um, Schurk and Schwartz realized that and immediately started writing a gravity theory and within about five, six years, were able to show that if you integrated out all the other modes of the string and just looked at the massless spin two modes um, as a low energy field theory, um, that that field theory was general relativity. Um, corrections to that come in at the Planck length squared. So string theory, string gravity uh, agrees with general relativity up to something like 10 to the 60 something or other. Uh, you know, it's a uh, very, very tight agreement. Very long time before we see the difference between string gravity and uh, general relativity. <clears throat> but to get back to Guillermo's question about the spin of the gluons, the standard model is built uh, as gauge theory. 
right? You have, you have um, free fields like the Dirac field. And uh, that Dirac action I've erased uh, has a global phase symmetry. You do what's called gauging and you ask, well, what do I have to do to make that phase symmetry local? And it turns out that you, you add a vector that gets interpreted as the vector potential for electromagnetism. And now you write a covariant derivative using that vector, covariant, uh, a U1 covariant derivative. So that if, if you have a, a field that has this phase invariant, say psi can change by e to the i phi. Um, if phi depends on position and you take a U1 covariant derivative, that e to the i phi comes out of the derivative and you just get the, uh, the phase times the covariant derivative of the original field. Now, um, <coughs> in order to uh, build that covariant derivative, a connection, uh, you may recall, is often uh, described as a uh, Lie algebra valued um, one form. And uh, that's, that's what always works. So if we have some Lie group uh, that we want to make local, we know for, for each uh, degree of freedom, for, for each dimension of that Lie group. So suppose we, we want to make, uh, let's see, uh, well, Lorentz transformations. Suppose we wanted to make Lorentz transformations local. All right, so there are six Lorentz transformations where the, the covariant derivative we need is going to be a Lie algebra valued one form. Uh, the fact that it's a one form is the key thing here. The Lie algebra value tells you how, how it acts on the field. Um, the one form uh, makes it a vector, which is a spin one object. So gauge fields always come out being spin one objects. Now, the uh, exception of relativity. Um, you can you can have higher spin objects, but um, let's see the sense in which let's see general relativity is a gauge theory. Um, well, the gauge field there is the the connection. Uh, usually, the spin connection if you're doing it as a gauge theory. Those are those are vectors too. But uh, in general relativity, you have one deeper level below the connection. You actually construct the connection from a metric and that metric is a spin two field. So that's how general relativity is different. But for the standard model, SU2, SU3, U1, um, all of the particles that carry those interactions are the, the gauge, are the connection fields, um, are the potentials for each of those forces, the electroweak and the strong um, interaction is a better term than force. The, um, so the gluons are, uh, have potentials given as the gauge fields of SU3. And those are vector particles. We assume they're massless. There's no, there's no evidence counter to their being uh, massless. Um, the, the weak particles are massive, um, and that has to be done by dynamical symmetry breaking. So let's see. Okay, there's the whole course in a nutshell. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, so it sounds like you guys are fairly comfortable with uh, the um, material in the preliminary section of the gauge theory book. You have the link to that so you can brush up on anything that's unfamiliar. So I will assume that you've got basically that, that level of familiarity with those. Uh, but if, on the other hand, you want me to talk in a bit more detail about any of those, that's fine. Uh, we, can, we can do that. Now, um, let's see. All right, the other thing that 
Uh, the other preliminary thing that um, I want you to be familiar with, I'm pulling it up for myself here, uh, is some um, Hamiltonian mechanics, which I know you guys know this because I just taught it to you last semester. So you guys are all experts in Hamilton Jacobi theory and all of that. Um, right at the end of class, I touched on canonical quantization. And this is probably going to be where we start. Uh, let's see, I, I've, I've updated my notes on this. So basically, I've condensed my notes on uh, classical, on Hamiltonian dynamics from last semester and uh, incorporated them in the, the field theory book as, as a starting point. I'll, uh, I don't think that version is posted yet, but I'll, I'll get that up shortly. Uh, so that's a review of ideas of phase space, Hamilton's equations, uh, the symplectic form. Um, and if you need any re review of that, well, read that and ask. I can, I can certainly uh, talk about any of that if you need a little bit of explanation, but I, I think you guys got that pretty well. Uh, what, what we're gonna look at is, then is canonical quantization. And let me see. Yeah, well, we have, we have time to start on that. The, the, um, the hurdle with canonical quantization, okay, it's pretty straightforward to uh, have a, like a, well, what would it be, you know, a Newtonian particle and uh, write the Hamiltonian version for uh, that particle motion and to then uh, uh, write Hamilton's equations using Poisson brackets. Is that familiar with, to anything you want to review of? Poisson brackets, how are you doing with Poisson brackets? We, okay, let's, let's see. Okay, you're, you're mostly muted, you're all muted here. Okay, uh, it's, but yes, good. So good about them. Yeah, I, I, it looked like mostly people were nodding there. So, okay, you can write Hamilton's equations in terms of Poisson brackets. You can write the time evolution of things in terms of Poisson brackets. And so here, we, we have direct, direct canonical quantization. Uh, write it down pretty quick because the rules are pretty quick. So, uh, for, for any two dynamical variables, say f and g, and you can tell me what a dynamical variable is, right? What's a dynamical variable? It sounds off, Guillermo. One depending on position and momentum and time, I guess. Um, uh, it, we're talking phase space here. So any That's function fair. of position and momentum. Momentum, okay. Any, fu any function of your canonical variables. Gotcha. So your P's and your Q's. Okay, so yeah, these are functions of uh, P's. Um, well, okay, so this, uh, if, I, if I let, uh, Psi A be um, all 2n of my canonical variables, then I can write this using the symplectic form BF, B psi A, BG, B psi B. Okay, how's that look to you? You guys okay? Uh, your head's kind of in the way. I can't really oh, see yeah. it. But I'm right. sure it looks great. Bam, there we go. Yes. Right where the symplectic form, oh boy, let's see, um, is uh, you want uh, a minus one in one off diagonal quadrant and a plus one in the other zeros here. This, this is gonna be the n by n 
identity here. Those and keys are canonical variables? The P, the P and Q are canonical. Well, the, you're, you're writing F and... Oh, oh, I see, I see. Never, I didn't even read that, thank you. Oh, okay. Yeah, so everybody good? Yeah, just, just shout out a few uh, clarification. So I, I forget where I put the minus sign in the notes, but um, the symplectic form, all right, who's got the good definition for a symplectic form? I know that it starts with preserves. Ah, okay, that, that's, that's one definition. Um, but uh, anti-symmetric two form? I feel like that's wrong. Non-degenerate. Non-degenerate. Non non, ah. yeah, non okay, you've, okay, two form, non-degenerate, one more property. Uh, bilinear, bilinearity, no? Uh, to two form, it's going to be it's inherently violent. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Uh, two form makes it anti symmetric. Is it uh, something about the determinant? Oh, wait, never mind. That's, that's, non -degeneracy. that's the non degeneracy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, you want it to be integral. Oh, okay. Closed. A closed non degenerate okay. two form. So I've got a two form omega. Take the derivative. The omega equals zero. And, uh, if you expand this on, this is a three form relation, it's anti symmetrizing on, on three indices. So alpha, beta, uh, u, anti symmetrize, then that guy's going to be zero. Um, that's an integrability condition that tells you that uh, in a star shaped region, omega can be written as. The exterior derivative of a um, presymplectic form. Uh, you can, it, you know, you can think of this as like PDX, and D of that is a closed non-degenerate two form. Uh, that, you know that that is the way it shows up in canonical variables. Now, uh, this this integrability condition. Um, uh, ultimately means that in uh, yeah let's see okay let's 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 go back to general relativity for a minute here um, what you know about manifolds metric manifolds uh, with connections and so on is that um, you can do a coordinate transformation that will make the Christoffel connection vanish at any given point. Right. And, you know, you can do that all with Taylor series, right? Uh, you know, you can just show, okay, if I do a coordinate transformation, I can choose these coordinates to make this vanish and that vanish. And you can show that you can write the metric in an expansion where it's basically the Minkowski metric plus nothing plus curvature stuff. And uh, you can do that, you know, expanding about a point. So at that point, the connection vanishes. All right, that's because you have a certain number of coordinate transformations. Well, the metric is a symmetric matrix that's got 16 degrees of freedom. The symplectic form only has six degrees of freedom. It's anti-symmetric, um, which means that if you do the same kind of analysis there on a symplectic form, um, you can reduce it to this canonical form everywhere. Right, you have enough coordinate degrees of freedom to uh, insist on this form at every point of your space. Uh, now, um, so th this integrability condition uh, it, it guarantees that. Now, um, the symplectic form, you know, it it matches its off diagonal, so it's going to match x and p's here. You know, one of these will be x, one will be p, and then there will be a minus sign when you flip them. And that's the familiar form of the uh, Poisson bracket. It's going to be um, F. So I guess I'm talking Q's here. B, G. And don't make the mistake of thinking that these indices only run from one to three. 
you know, if you've got an n particle system, they run up to three n, or you know, it's the number of degrees of freedom of your system. So it really could be most anything, but you sum over all of them there, and that's the Poisson bracket of f and g. Then we have canonical Poisson brackets, where we now. All right, I, I show a bunch of stuff in these notes, and if uh, if any of my claims here, uh, it's like, well, you know, why did you say that? Is that really true? Um, I, I prove it in the notes, and so uh, you can, you can go back to that and you know check check out these things are established. But I'm I'm just gonna go over some basics here for right now. The uh, uh, important properties of these Poisson brackets. Now, okay, they're obviously they're going to be anti-symmetric. Uh, they they actually satisfy a, a Jacobi identity, so they um, they act like a Lie algebra. Uh, but most importantly, if I have any two sets of canonical variables. Um, chi and psi say, uh, the Poisson brackets are the same. Uh, the Poisson brackets preserve Hamilton's equations. Um, in fact, I can, I can uh, well, let's just let's see. Um, they're, it's not what I meant. So they are invariant under canonical transformations, where canonical transformations are those transformations that preserve Hamilton's equations. Uh, we can write Hamilton's equation, say, uh, um, I keep writing X, uh, by using the Hamiltonian, this is going to give X dot, and P with the Hamiltonian is going to give P dot. For a general function, um, the total time derivative of a general dynamical variable is uh, found by forming its Poisson bracket with a Hamiltonian and adding any direct dependence from the partial derivative. So uh, quite generally, the Hamiltonian is the thing that generates time evolution. <clears throat> now, the fact that I can compute these Poisson brackets in any uh, set of dynamical variables, I can, in particular, I can, compute the bracket of, uh, let's say, xi with xj. And that's going to be the xi dxk dxj partial pk minus the other way around, the xi dpk dxj dxj. And what's this equal to? Zero? Is that zero? That's zero, yeah. Because why? Well, partial x partial p is zero. Yeah. yeah, the the coordinates are all independent. So partial x partial p is zero. So this vanishes identically as does um, p with p. So pi with p j. And I'm computing this in the xp basis, right? So it's trivial to do it. Well, then if I do X with P, um, it's, I'm going to get a P here, then I get an XP and a PX. So the second term is zero, but this one is going to be a chronic like that. Okay. And since it's anti-symmetric, I can summarize all three of those relationships by saying that Psi A with Psi B is the inverse symplectic form, right? And can you, now, uh, yeah, can you just show, I guess, like explicitly do it? Uh, we just did. Okay, so um, uh, for for A and B uh, running one through N, that's the X with X. So that's right. be the top uh, left square. N, N plus I and N plus J, that's P with P. Thank and, you. Yeah. And then the cross one is this one. 
and it's anti-symmetric, okay, so you get the minus one here. You see it now, yeah. And yeah, good. Thanks for asking. Um, always, always jump in and ask if it's not clear. Let's just clear it up. Thank you. Um, so uh, yeah, so we get this immediately, um, which probably tells you what the right what the right sign of this is. Uh, now, this here we could computed this using itself as the basis, but the invariance of Poisson brackets under canonical transformation means I'll get that no matter what basis I use. So I've got a test here for canonical variables. Then uh, from that, we want to do canonical quantization. So now that we know how to find canonical variables, and I, I think you guys had a problem on that last problem set last semester showing that not everything is a canonical variable. Uh, there, um, you, you can't make just anything into a canonical variable. It has to be a coordinate transformation that preserves Hamilton's equations. So now, what are we gonna do? Drac proposes the following rule. We're gonna uh, take our fundamental Poisson brackets. Right, so this is this is basically one chronic or IJ. And we're gonna do a few things at once. We're gonna take our all dynamical vari variables, in, including our coordinates, and we're going to put hats on them because we're making them operators on some uh, some inner product vector space uh, yet to be defined. But you know that's that's you know pretty much the principle hurdle you have when you want to quantize some system is uh, defining that space clearly. Uh, then we're going to let the Poisson bracket itself go to IH bar times a commutator of the uh, of these operators. So being operators, they act on the one another as well. And so uh, in place of the Poisson bracket, I'm going to have a commutation relation between PI and PJ, and that's going to be IH bar uh, times one. So this gives us the uh, fundamental commutator for our basic variables. Then dynamical, vari dynamical variables, some F of Q and P. Um, it's going to be also going to become an operator, uh, which will be defined to be that same function evaluated at the um, fundamental operators. So you, you take whatever function you had, you plug in the operators q hat and p hat, and that gives you uh, an operator for your dynamical variable. Now. This is not quite enough because uh, it, suppose I have something like, uh, you know, if F is some, let me see here, uh, you know, suppose we have uh, X dot P, so, sorry, I keep switching between Q's and P's here, uh, Q dot P. Well, uh, where this goes is questionable because we can write Q hat, P hat, or we can write P hat, Q hat. And Dirac's uh, rule here doesn't tell us which of those to do. What we're going to find when we start looking at field theory is that the thing that works is um, normal ordering. Now, unfortunately, normal ordering doesn't act on your canonical variables. It, uh, acts on some, um, let's see, what is it? Uh, 
well, some, some adjoint pair of operators, creation and annihilation operators that are linear combinations of the keys and the cues. <clears throat> so it's not a rule we can specify here. What, what happens for P's and Q's that usually works right is to take the symmetric combination. Uh, classical physics doesn't tell you what order to write Q's and P's in, but quantum mechanics, it matters. So this is one of the rules we have to invent as we go along. And uh, when we get to field theory, we will invent a thing called normal ordering. And that'll, uh, that'll, that'll be effective in um, getting rid of some divergent quantities, in fact. The first divergence you come on, you can, you can fix by normal ordering things. Uh, hang on here a second. Hmm, I just noticed the chat, a cry for help. Who's crying for help? That was <laughs> your, cat, cat. your cat meowed. Oh, the cat, okay, it was the cat. Aww. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty good transcription of Ross. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm, I'm glad it wasn't one of you crying for help. Uh, you, you seem to be getting it okay. okay. This is uh, not, this is not, Hard stuff. Uh, yeah. Um, quantum mechanics, uh, quantum field theory has not been digested the way uh, EM or classical uh, mechanics uh, has. So, you know, I can, I, I, here, I can write uh, this DA and um, uh, star D star F equals J. That's all of electromagnetism. We're good, right? Differential forms are nice. Uh, we can't do that in quantum field theory. It's very confusing. And there are long books written on quantum field theory because techniques are still being developed, uh, you know, uh, digesting things and writing notation that makes it uh, as concise as possible uh, may yet need to be developed. And who knows, we may just be doing it all wrong, like epicycles, right? Uh, you know, the, <clears throat> yeah, the good and bad news about planetary, you know, epicycles, planetary uh, orbits on orbits. So this was the Ptolemaic system for describing planetary motions, right? An ellipse is, can be described as a, a circle moving on a circle where where the rate of rotation of the outer circle is, you know, just the right uh, small multiple of the rotation of the, what is it, like one to one maybe, um, whatever it is. You can make an ellipse by having a circle move on a circle at just the same speed. I don't know, try it, build something. Uh, but- um, Isn't that like, like similar to how like, you can do really weird shapes with Fourier series? Precisely, yes. That's that's why the Ptolemaic system was was so good. You can describe any orbit <laughs> by putting enough epicycles on the epicycles. You know, uh, circles were the perfect thing. So you just you had to keep adding these circles on circles on circles. You can describe literally any orbit with a Fourier series, and that's what you're doing. So uh, yeah, very powerful. And you know, for a thousand years or so. Uh, that was the way to go until Newton's law of gravity gave you a, a very different picture of what's going on. Well, what we're doing with Feynman path integrals may be epicycles. You know, there may be some much easier way to do all of this and you know, we're just not seeing it. Um, so one of you go out and invent that, okay. Uh, yeah. That's that a homework assignment for next week? Yeah, I have to make a cesium uh, clock first. So. Yeah, so the week after. So one week from Monday, you know, bring in your new field theory uh, calculational method. <laughs> I have great faith in all of you. <laughs> okay, so, uh, uh, you know, this, this actually uh, works. Um, you can then, uh, all right, the Hamiltonian becomes an operator the same way as the, you know, it's a dynamical variable. So the Hamiltonian becomes some operator. Uh, 
you, you can write the time evolution uh, of any dynamical variable as a combination of its partial derivative and uh, its commutator with the Hamiltonian operator when you write it as an operator. So, okay, you know, we get, okay, quantum mechanics pretty much falls out here. Uh, it's just these few simple rules that Dirac proposed. So the thing that is going to be uh, the first hurdle, and hopefully I'll have notes written on this by Monday. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've got I've to work this up for you. I think you may have actually seen this in Charlie's class, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, these, these derivatives in a field theory become functional derivatives. All right, and that's, that's the thing we've got to nudge into place. So we're going to be dealing with fields, not just particle position and momentum variables, but um, this is going to be a field, this is going to be its conjugate field. And uh, so did you talk about the Hamiltonian formulation of field theory? We did not. We did not. Yeah, we okay. actually skipped that chapter. All right, okay. so. So we, that, we could go right through it, I guess, over the weekend or something. Yeah, well, I'll you know, I'm, I'm not, not any great hurdle, but it'll give me something to talk about next week. Uh, so, yeah, we'll, uh, yeah, I, I, so I'll take care of that. You develop the replacement for Feynman diagrams, and then, you know, we'll have it all wrapped up in a couple of weeks and we can uh, play with the cat. So, <laughs> play fetch with the cat. It's very weird. The other, we have two cats. The other one doesn't uh, come down here that much, but he barks. We accidentally picked up two dogs. I don't know. I'd, they, they looked like cats. But the the dog uh, software is on the cat uh, hardware. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so, um, so we need to do this with field theory. And maybe the next thing to jump into, I'm still trying to get these notes organized. I, I, I worked on quantum field theory or quantum mechanics first to get all those notes in line. So I'm still racing to catch up with this uh, over vacation. I wrote a paper. So but, you're uh, going to be um, replacing yes. your, um, your quantum field theory text that's online now with the more up-to-date version. Is that what- That's right, yeah, there? yeah. So, um, yeah, no need to read the whole thing real quick. <laughs> I'll, I'll be updating it as we go. Although, uh, you know, it's not bad. Um, you know, there's there's some good stuff in there. Yeah, I was just reading the stuff on chronicity yesterday, and yeah, that was that was actually pretty clear. But I did write it. Oh, geez. Uh, yeah, back when, back when licks. Did, no, it was probably before licks. I was probably still using. What, what was it? Uh, there was some other uh, LaTeX editor uh, that it only worked on PCs, so I had to get a PC emulator for my Mac, and then you know run the scientific word it was called. Um, it's not as good as Lake anyway for for writing LaTeX, but huh, yeah, the good old days. Okay, so uh, now let's let's look at a field theory and see what happens. What do we got? Uh, Oh, let's see. We got we got five minutes, so uh, I got to piece right down something. Um, so, in order to implement the Dirac procedure, we need to develop uh, Hamiltonian. Theory for uh, for fields. So let's just write a field theory. Uh, so we start with the action, and if you can't write an action for a theory, then no one knows how to quantize it, right? Because the way you quantize a theory is the sum of our histories. That involves the action. If you don't have that, then you you have to invent a whole new way to do quantum theory. Happily, all the, the interactions we know with right actions. So uh, let's let's look at a Klein-Gordon field. And does anybody remember what sign goes here? Uh, 
minus. Oh no, it's it's a plus. There's a minus out front, right? Out uh, here. Yeah. Like minus out there. And then plus on the inside, yeah. Uh, let's see. Okay, so um, the way I think about, it, I think of a pure uh, stationary oscillating wave, right? So I think of phi as being e to the um, i e t over h bar, and so. Uh, Let's see, I'm going to I'm going to vary this, so I'm going to have an integration by parts. So I'm going to get minus box phi minus m squared phi zero. And I want to know if that's the right sign here. So if I if I take box of this, I have this minus sign. Then I have uh, minus dt is going to. Um, let's see, I've got uh, yeah minus sign because of the Lorentz signature, and then I've got an i. E squared coming down, that's fine. So, uh, how many minus signs is that? Too many, right? This yeah, one well, too many yet. Plus, that becomes minus, so I better put a plus here. All right, so let's make that plus. And uh, I don't worry about that one. Sometimes a half is nice here. Um, and I don't know, it could be that we want to minus out there um, because. It's nice if the momentum comes out being a positive thing. So what do we do here? So, okay, you can quickly check, you know, E is just MC squared. So, so C is one, so it's just M. So then this works. Okay, so quick check on your signs. Now, uh, what is the conjugate momentum? So, uh, all right, we, we know that pi ought to be the partial of the Lagrangian with respect to uh, the time derivative of the field, right? And, you know, we're still going to use that. Well, what's the Lagrangian? Okay, I, I assume Charlie went through this kind of thing, but if, you, if you've got LDT, uh, you can build L out of densities of some sort, right? So I can write L as some sort of a spatial integral over, over fields. And that's, that's what we've done here. And then the dt here and the dx there become a d4x and you're integrating over space time. So uh, nonetheless, and this is a certain awkwardness that you run into in quantum field theory, because quantum field theory is relativistic, uh, is, is that, um, you know, time's not supposed to be special. And yet, you know, our, our very definition of uh, the conjugate momentum hinges on, you know, picking a time. Um, on the other hand, it's not a sin to pick a gauge or to pick a set of coordinates, as long as you check at the end that what you've written is invariant. So, um, Sometimes you need coordinates. It's okay. All right. So how do we how do we do this? Well, we can write S as uh, let's see what is this? Uh, one of these is up and one of these is down. So we're going to have a let's see phi dot squared um, with the minus sign, right? Plus grad phi dot grad. Phi. Have I got my signs right here? Plus m squared phi squared. So we have something like this. So here's our phi dot. And yeah, this this may be why we want a minus sign out here. Thank you, Lyle. No. Oh wait, who's who's gave you the minus sign? That was me. Tyler. Oh, Tyler. Thank you, Tyler. Yeah, and I, I, we might want that minus sign. Yeah, keep this this one positive. So now uh, let's let's write this a little more explicitly. We have uh, et and then e3x of all this stuff. And let me not write it all out because we've run out of time. But now uh, this means we're going to take um, dd phi dot of that. But um, all right. You, you remember when we do conservation laws 
uh, we're looking at DDT of some kind of surcharge and SDDT of uh, some uh, charge density. And when we bring this inside, this charge density inside depends on position because we haven't integrated it out yet. So as we move through, that becomes a partial of rho with respect to time. And then you use the, um, the continuity equation to write this as a divergence and integrate to a surface term and you, you get conservation. DQ dt is what flows out over the boundary, or minus what flows out over the boundary. Right, you've seen that calculation somewhere. Well, the thing I'm emphasizing here is that in bringing a total derivative inside, it becomes a partial derivative. Partial is derivative is just a, an admission that we're now differentiating a function of many variables. Same thing is gonna happen here, except the recognition is something very different. When we bring this partial derivative inside the integral, it's gonna become a functional derivative. So we need the functional derivative of uh, what happens. Um, a functional derivative of the Lagrangian because the Lagrangian um, is uh, functional of the fields. So let's see, well, you don't have to bring it inside here. Just the, the fact that the Lagrangian is, is, is this step, the fact that the Lagrangian is no longer a function but is a functional of fields means that we change that partial derivative to a functional derivative. And now we're out of time and you guys have to go teach lab. So, uh, but. I can stay on for questions or discussion or uh, meet your cats, whatever. It's good to see you guys. It's good to be back. All right. So, uh, yeah, see you next month. I'll try to get stuff online. Um, you know, I, yeah, I'm still, I'm still putting stuff up. So, uh, any any questions? I mean, yeah, I don't have to rush off here. So, whatever is on your mind. No? no, anybody? Not right now. I, I have no, a small but I mean, question. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I, I guess I, I this might might have been brought up like uh, like in other classes, and, and I guess I forgot. But I, um, what's the what's the motivation behind going from, uh, I guess, uh, in a sort of like a billion, like algebra with with the variables, and then going to operators, which is like this non-abelian field or algebra, I should say. Uh, Answer this. I, have, I right. think I have so, an idea. So going, going from, yeah, let's see. It's just what I talked about in, uh, on the mechanics this morning. Um, the, uh, my understanding of, my post on understanding of uh, going from, say, uh, a variable P to uh, IH bar grad or from energy to IH bar DDT, right? These, these become operators on a Hilbert space, right? Now that, that Hilbert space, that can be any complete inner product space, right? It can be finite dimension, what, whatever. But uh, these things become operators. Well, this is if it's acting on a function, but it, it could be acting on states some sort, um, but it is, it is some kind of linear operator on some, uh, some vector space. And, uh, you know, then uh, we get away from that actually with the path integral. Uh, you know, you might wanna take another look at uh, in the gauge theory book on the derivation of the path integral because what happens is you keep sticking in bases and sticking in, you know, the identity you know, uh, you know, ket bra, ket bra combinations until you actually end up with the um, the final path integral um, having no operators left in it. You actually you actually end up getting rid of all the operators. It's it's uh, very cool. So um, you can understand the path integral in one sense as something that eliminates the need to go to um, operators. Yeah, I guess it's operators because the, um, 
you know, you, you no longer have a preferred curve, a preferred evolution for things. Uh, a particle, you know, you see it here and you see it here. Well, it didn't just follow the line between those or it didn't follow just that curve. It might have followed everything. And now you, you may need some probabilities and some to know how those probabilities are changing. And that, that could require some operators on that function space uh, that characterizes how things are evolving from here to there. Yeah, I like to think of um, quantum mechanics, quantum field theory as um, the, uh, the, 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 the dynamical evolution in quantum theory as being simply due to the mission that we are not going to assume stuff that we can't know about the system. So we measure the system here, we're making a prediction about it there based on every possible way it can evolve from here to there instead of assuming that we know how it's going to act. And I, I think just that change gets you halfway to being able to write uh, a quantum theory for most anything. Uh, the other thing, and you know, this is my take on it, but um, I think of the state as a list. You know, if you look at like the state for the EPR, you know, it's a, it's a sum of terms. Well, if you look at what those terms are, they're each possible thing that could be measured. It's a list. It's a list of every possible outcome of measurement based on what you do know about the system and not based on what you don't know. So when you make a measurement, you're, you're picking one of the elements in that list. And as a result, you end up with one of the elements of that list. And so what you have to do is uh, you have to make a new list. You erase half the stuff in the list because you just measured that, you know, oh, it's, it's not any of those, it's this. So your list immediately changes. Um, some people like to call that the collapse of the wave function. I do not like to call that the collapse of the wave function. I think of it as erasing half the list. Um, so those, those two things, not assuming that uh, we know how something's going to move when we don't know. So don't assume anything you don't know about the system. And uh, keep track of what you do and don't know in a list. I think that really is what you need to construct quantum theory. Uh, maybe, I, I, I'm not sure that includes normal ordering. So, you know, there, there are some additional rules that we need for field theory, but uh, you can go pretty far just with those, those ideas. So uh, another question? Yeah, so from that perspective, does that, does that say like, because uh, I was, looked at it the other way, like, oh, we have eigenvalues are important in quantum mechanics because we have operators. Is this interpretation actually that operators are used in quantum mechanics because they have spectrums of eigenvectors, which are encapsulating these different systems like you're talking about? Like there's different states that the, the so, so like more that we care, we care that there's stationary measures, that there's different stationary states and operators are the natural way to catch to catch that rather than somebody just said operators we're going to use and so they have eigenvalues and so therefore block yeah uh let's see well the early his history is a hodgepodge right you know heisenberg did it one way and schrodinger did it another and uh the um you know the the field theory has turned out to be very useful uh you know for other reasons entirely um you know if you if you write a wave function like I did this morning is a, a plane wave and instead of k and omega you write it in terms of e and p you find that um, a way to extract those numbers in in the uh, phase is to act with some derivative operators you know but um, you know quantization eigenvalues works well with uh, the Heisenberg picture you know uh, you write a matrix for everything you end up writing infinite dimensional matrices, but you know, that's okay. Um, so uh, I don't know, is it a chicken and egg kind of question? Uh, maybe, 
I, you know, I, I don't, I don't know that you have to have one of the other of those first. Some people, some people say anything that predicts all of the eigenvalues of your relevant operators um, is, is your whole quantum theory. You know, that's all you ever measure. So, you know, that's a valid claim. Uh, I guess that was my question because I, I was just, we just learned at operators then I was like, oh, well, that's just the thing you have. So then you have eigenvalues, but like you're saying, there is some sense that if you have an object that recreates all the eigenvalues, then you have the quantum theory, yeah. even if you don't yeah. have an operator. Yeah, you, you see, you see that claim here and there. And that, that's, that's gotta be right, right? That's, that's all that we're ever going to measure are those eigenvalues. So uh, it's a fair claim. Yeah, and you know, and there's so many stories that people build to go along with quantum physics, right? You know, you've got like ever many worlds and you know, think how many worlds you create when you glance around the room. Uh, you know, uh, is it practical for computing anything? Does it have internal contradictions? No, I don't know. Uh, it, you know, maybe, maybe not. Um, I don't know how to make a prediction from the many worlds picture. Um, you know, people worry a lot about the relationship of human consciousness because there's this idea that the, the, the act of observation is somehow changes the state. Well, you know, it changes our knowledge about the state, but what is the interaction between consciousness and the world? And, you know, you, you get these interesting contradictions where, you know, the, the particles that you see are different than the particles that I see. Uh, you know, that we can be, you know, working with very different states uh, to describe the same system. That's complicated. Um, let's see, I was headed somewhere with that. The, uh, the, the Gilman Hartle picture uh, avoids that. Gilman Hartle talk about uh, decohering events. So basically uh, the entire world is, you know, one quantum system and it doesn't care how we interpret it. What, what we do when we take a measurement is uh, basically we allow our quantum system to interact with something we have chosen to regard as a coarse grained system. So, uh, you know, pool table, pool balls flying all over. All right, that's a pool table with pool balls flying all over. It's a gas with temperature T, right? So. All right, here I've got a liter of gas. I'm going to describe it by its temperature and pressure and density, right? Like three numbers, uh, but you know, it's Avogadro's number of somethings, right? And I'm so I'm coarse graining. I'm I'm choosing to neglect certain properties that are irrelevant to me in favor of ones that are relevant to me. Well, so uh Gilman and Hart will talk about a decohering event where um Basically, you've got uh, anything that, um, you know, like, uh, well, would be regarded as a coarse grain system, like a rock. So you get a photon passing through a rock and leaving some kind of trail. <clears throat> well, you know, that, that rock is a, a coarse grain system in the sense that we think of it as a rock, not as a, a jillion uh, quantum states. So, you know, as long as we regard everything in the environment as quantum, uh, you know, you, you don't have uh, any erasing of the list, right? That, that doesn't ever have to happen, except that we can't keep track of that many things. Because a rock can't read far enough down the list. It only knows how to read A, B, and C, so it can't see what the dog says. Well, the, it, the rock- it, it's, it's insensitive to this. Actually- By definition. You know, it, it depends, it depends. The, you know, the, the rock, the rock is still, you know, some complicated quantum state itself. And it, uh, it records all the interactions that the photon had in passing through, but. Um, or, or the pre-rock does that, because the, the human consciousness sees the rock and says the rock is just yeah. the, the part that doesn't interact with quantum mechanics. But the, yeah, yeah okay, sorry, the, the pre-rock has the quantum stuff maybe. Yeah, I don't know what so, so any, any time that a quantum state interacts with a classical system, a classical system is a coarse grain system, uh, you know, then you're gonna lose quantum information. So, so uh, 
you know, if we go into that rock with a, some sort of electron microscope and reconstruct the entire quantum state, then, you know, uh, fine. You know, you've got all the information about what went on, but we don't do that. That's, uh, that's not very useful. Um, you know, there's a certain amount of pragmatism in using classical systems to, to uh, label our experience. And in some senses, it would redefine what a rock means, right? It would be, it wouldn't be the same object necessarily yeah. because it would create yeah. a quantum rock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is it that Donovan said? First it is a mountain, then there is no mountain, then there is. Yeah, well, is it a rock or a quantum state? <laughs> okay. Uh, so is that, is that, is that, that sounds chicken, is this, is this like an ongoing chicken in the egg kind of issue thing is that, is it, is a human a classical system that's trying to do quantum mechanics or are we a quantum mechanical system that's trying to do classical mechanics? Is that kind of another way to <laughs> Yeah, you can think of that. Well, you know, I, I think, I think the most coherent view is that, you know, it's, it's all some quantum thing. Uh, so yeah, you know, people are checking out. Yeah, feel free to go when you need. Um, uh, the uh, you know it's it's all it's all some quantum system all all the time. Um, you know that's not very useful when I want to make lunch, <laughs> right? So you know in in a practical sense, uh, uh, um, course graining our world is very useful. Uh, now, for some purposes, it's even more useful not to coarse grain it. I, you know, it depends if I'm building, you know, uh, lunch or a laser. You know, whether I want to preserve all the quantum information or not. Um, you know, I mean, the the huge number of quantum-based de devices that uh, we use now all the time you know, in, in medicine or satellites or communications or, you know, these computers or, you know, you, you, the list is pretty endless. Um, you know, there we're, we're interested in preserving quantum information for, for a long time in order to, to build those things and make them work. Um, you know, and then you put that laser in an automatic door opener and you don't care whether the door opens just this way or just that way. So, it, it's, uh, yeah, has a lot to do, you know, whether, whether or not we resort to the crude approximation of a classical state, uh, you know, depends on what, what we want to do and who knows what makes us want to do things. <laughs> you know? but, I mean, is this all to say also that, would string theory say that quantum, quantum field theory is a coarse graining then? By the same, um, could you could you argue that yeah our universe is a coarse graining? No, it's it's more that yeah. Uh, uh, let's see. So you get you get gauge theories as low energy string theories. So it's it's more that it's a certain regime of string theory uh, than uh, uh, coarse graining. I mean, it's still it's still going to be some, you know, it's going to reduce to the standard model. It's still a quantum theory. Uh, so, so, no, uh, string, string theory, string theory is actually closer to particle theory. You know, you're, you, you've got this idealized piece of string that's moving around, uh, but it turns out it's got a lot of explanatory power. I see. Um, so of course, but, graining is specifically for like information loss. That's what, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I you. Okay. Yeah. That's, you know, uh, if, calling this thing behind me a whiteboard instead of uh, a, um, a plus polymer of plastic molecules done such, such, such in these quantum states. So there is some quantum state that describes that whiteboard in complete quantum detail. It's, there's, that's in some state, it's a big complicated one. Um, and, yeah. and yeah, when I, when I write on it with a marker, I don't care if, if uh, my line is a millimeter off or something. Um, you know, I'm, I'm interested in some fairly gross features of that quantum state. Yeah, okay. resolution, it's resolution. Yeah, 
uh-huh. we're training again. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's so, like a scattering. It's like this is like scattering into different course, size. Course, course graining is when you um, you uh, lump uh, a number of actually different states as uh, one as as one thing. Um, where where you lose you, all right, so you you have twenty different states that all behave the same, you know, in this kind of configuration. So you name that kind of configuration and don't worry about which of the 20 states it is. Uh, and you only care about the, the, the I mean, the, the, the stationary conditions of all 20 states. So it's like the greatest common denominator. Yeah, of all so, so yeah, the, the, the aspects of those 20 things that, um, interactively they have in common. So uh, the, um, you know, the, yeah, the, the aspects of the evolution of this uh, combination of 20 states that are the same, no matter which combination of the 20 states is going on inside, um, the, the net effect when these 20 meet those Avogadro's number is the same uh, because I'm only interested in certain possible outcomes. But yeah, yeah. But course training is regarding some uh, multiplicity of states, quite often a very large number of states as uh, being described by actually just a few uh, parameters that are of interest. So it's like that next then like the kind of the, it's the, theory of coarse graining then that's another way to say it because they just you don't even it's a it, that is the 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 whole the whole method is just trying you're just playing with 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 coarse graining right i mean that's the whole idea that you start with but um okay yeah i mean i'm just you know it's again thermodynamics quantum mechanics and gr <laughs> are kind of all so so yeah um, okay yeah of course Okay, sorry. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Yeah, this is all new. So. Yes. Take a deep breath, write down all your questions. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Now, you know, the cool thing about string theory is that it's a quantum theory before it's a gravity theory. Yeah. You know, you're not trying to take general relativity and pretend it's some kind of field theory and, you know, use Dirac rules on it or something. You're starting with something that is a quantum system, and you're finding that the states of that system can be combined in ways that replicate the Poincaré Lie algebra. And wow. so, you know, some some uh, some manifestations of that quantum system are going to look like gravity, like general relativity. So, and it uh, wait, is, so is is gravity is gravity then? Uh, Oh, I, I just, I just, I just lost the word uh, that we were using. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, coarse grain is is gravity coarse grained in string theory, like because it's it's thermodynamics, like it is thermodynamic. Uh, yeah, I guess is it thermodynamics uh, strictly in string theory? You know, it might be fair to say so. Um, you know, yeah. If, yeah. So the way you would get something like general relativity is by considering, say, a gas of string. And you know each string is a massless spin two mode of excitation of this fundamental object, the string, um, and you're exchanging those, you know, in some nonlinear way. The interaction is nonlinear, but uh, at at low energy, that gas um, uh, replicates the properties of curved spacetime. Ten dimensional one, unfortunately, you've got to compactify and other things too. But uh, so a, a low energy gas of string um, has an alternative interpretation as a curved space time. The um, yeah, the actual arena where you set up the string theory to begin with is is flat. Is this so? Is this the ADS CFT then? Is it, yeah, is this the ADS CFT? Oh, uh, not necessarily, not necessarily. 
No, uh, the, I'm thinking back to Green and Schwartz uh, in 76, okay. uh, where, where they showed that um, the, the uh, low energy ef uh, effective um, action for uh, the spin two modes of string uh, are, uh, is general relativity, is, is the Einstein Hilbert action. Okay. Yeah, I mean, so the picture, because I was kind of thinking about this over the break, um, the picture I kind of got to, and of course, this is like, I don't know what I'm talking about, but is that like, you know, curvature in some senses is finding that there's more space somewhere than you thought there was, right? You you, you walk the path and you find out you had to take more steps than you thought or, or, or fewer, or, distance, or fewer. Yeah. So, no. so. No. In that sense, is string theory kind of like you're you're knotting up space time so that when you see a curvature, you're actually seeing a bunch of wiggles that you didn't think you saw before, and so you're you're taking a much farther path than you thought. Mm. Uh, and this is all quote unquote because we're talking and, uh, particle I, paths. You know, and I, kind of I don't think that's quite right? the right thing because you know you're you're setting up uh, a mathematical equality between a space with these properties, like you know. A, a sphere or some curved manifold and a um, a gas of vibrating strings and, um, in flat space mm -hmm. so um, so let's see so let's see how does how does that actually work imagining like that the space operator would end up being some propagation through the mode op Raiders again, words I don't know, but like <laughs> that would be the the length I think would be the length I was thinking would happen on like it would be like propagation distances for particles, which would be like energy levels. I, again, I don't know what I'm talking about, but uh, yeah, that, that's so you add you add more energy, and then you see more like muons show up that you have to fight your resistance at the local particle level. Level. So to get an electron to propagate through this new C would take a lot longer because it would be yeah, combining that, that's, uh, that's that's possible. Yeah. So so yeah. So how do we actually measure this gas of spin two modes? Well, mm -hmm. you know, we send some spin one modes through it. They interact in certain ways and take longer, take a, a, a more uh, curved trajectory through it. Uh, that might be a way to look at it, because um, yeah, these these strings interact, and uh, they don't infer gravity. That was kind of that was kind of the mind blowing. I came across this lot because I always thought string theory like had explicitly gravity in it, but it just falls out, right? I mean, and that's what I'm reading. Like, yeah, it's, it's yeah. gravity is one of the fields you get out of string theory. One one of the interactions you get out of string theory. It's actually the closed strings. Uh, you know, uh, you have a piece of string and you know, it can spin this way, but it can also have periodic boundary conditions. So you have closed loops of string. Those are okay. the spin two modes. So those are the ones, the closed strings are the ones that uh, carry the gravitational interaction. But yeah, it, it, is, it is built up discreetly, you know, by, you know, the exchange of of course, very many uh, closed strings. Um, you know, it's it's a useful picture for some stuff. Like, um, all right, so suppose you're worried about the singularity at the center of a black hole. Well, so what's happening there? Okay, a star collapses, passes through its short chill radius, and now it's in a finite proper time, uh, in general relativity, going to go singular. Well. You know, that's not what happens, right? What happens is it gets down to a sufficient uh, scale that um, it really looks like a bunch of strings moving in 10 dimensions, not a four dimensional singularity. So string, string theory right away lets you avoid the singularity because you, you know that at high enough energy, it's gonna look like string, not like just a bunch of spin two modes, not, not uh, not just like a curved space time. Now you see that in the effective field theory because there are corrections to general relativity from string theory. Uh, you, you, get a, you get a Gauss-Binet term as the quadratic gravity contribution 
you know, people have computed the third, probably the fourth order corrections to gravity, but they, they come in that with powers of the Planck length uh, coefficients. So it's not until you get to those extreme energies at the Planck scale that you would really start seeing the gravity theory change, uh, say radically and um, really stringy behavior uh, reemerge. So, um, you know, I don't know how you would calculate any of that, but you know, the picture is clear enough. Uh, you know, it's the, the black hole singularity is not a problem. In string theory, it's not. Now, you know, there are, that's maybe not the only theory out there, but uh, it's, it's the only theory I know where a quantum system displays Poincaré, uh, uh, it contains the Poincaré symmetry uh, among the quantum operators. The, the just so I can use my words, that's, that's when we have a free particle is why we want that, right? Because it's representing free space translations as well. Am I doing that right? Oh, the Poincaré, the Poincaré group is Lorentz plus, plus, Lorentz. plus translations, yes. Translations and Lorentz, okay. that's right. Sorry. Yeah. And now you, you mentioned the, the modes, the mode operators. That's, okay. that's not a terribly complicated idea because right, think of a classical solution for you know, motion on a string. You've got a string under tension, maybe because it's spinning or something, but you've got a string under tension and you get different wave modes. You can write a Fourier series for the solution for the position of you know, points along the, the string, some parameterized set of points. Okay, so now, you know, that's, that replaces your position coordinate. It, it, you know, it's, you know, it's X mu of sigma and sigma takes you along the length of the string and you quantize that, right? So that becomes an X hat. Well, what that means is, okay, you've, you've expanded the position of the string as some Fourier series, you know, uh, alpha mu N e to the i n sigma, right? And, and then there's a, a tau for the time dependence. Um, okay, well, those, those coefficients in that Fourier series become operators. Those are your mode operators, right? And there are certain quadratic combinations of those mode operators, uh, a certain subset of the quadratic combinations of those that um, satisfy the Poincaré algebra. So it's just a direct, like, particle like quantization, you build certain combinations of operators, they replicate the Poincaré group as it happens in 26 mm -hmm. dimensions, but, but yeah, you can fix that. And okay. Okay. And they're building this off of the positive frequency spectrum. Uh, 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 Alex, oh, your, your sound was going garbly there a minute. I'm sorry. Is that, yeah. and, and, and this is what's generating the positive frequency spectrum then are these, these, these string operators? These wave mode operators, and some, and I think they're they're like going to be a sum of, there's going to be a function of them, so they won't just sum. But that's yeah, so so you you have a countable infinity of these mode operators, and mm -hmm. um, and they're daggers, and you probably just do harmonic oscillator type stuff to create your space of states. So so you act with the alpha daggers to create any sort of uh, uh, oscillatory state of the string quantum state of the string and uh, uh, yeah the, the sorry that was my question the, the a plus are effectively the creation operators right yeah for, for the dimension for the quantized dimension that yeah. quantum curl. That, that plus is a dagger but yeah oh duh. yeah okay sorry <laughs> uh, yeah. I'll pass it. okay cool <laughs> cool thanks I'll, I'll, I'll harass you into precision sorry <laughs> no you should you need to absolutely that's what is it? I'm, I'm supposed to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, the whip. That's How right. About Guillermo, you're you're quiet down there. You got a, well, you're down low on my screen, but there you are. Hi. Um, any questions? How are you doing with all this? Oh well, yeah, I'm following it pretty well. I mean, I haven't been. I'm interested in, in learning more on string theory, so some of these terms are going over me. But the, conceptually, I can see where where you're coming from. But no, I just wanted to like, uh, I actually discovered something interesting, a text uh, because uh -huh. um, the author of, of that really famous 
uh, GR book called, uh, hold on, let me bring it. Oh, uh, Space Time and Geometry Intro to GR uh, by Sean Carroll. Oh, Sean Carroll, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, he, he, <laughs> we call it walled light. Uh, okay. <laughs> what a what a statement. Um, so he actually tweeted out a photo of a text I've never heard about called Quantum Social Science. And it's, uh, yeah, it's, so it's essentially uh, trying to use the mathematical framework um, using in Q, QM, basically using probabilistic wave theory. Yeah, and using it, trying to use it on in the soft sciences to to build the a, like the, a new framework that can answer some of the paradoxes that that they have in the, I guess in their current framework. Hmm. Yeah, the, I I didn't I didn't read all of it obviously, and some some of the econ. Okay, so mm -hmm. they 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 wanted to go over economics, finances, and I think so, some social sciences like uh, sociology. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Let's see. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, so, so some of those topics are, are pretty are pretty advanced. Like in, in the like the econ finance, I, I'm like I have nothing. I know nothing about that. But I did read a little bit of, of it. The premise of it, the preface, what what they're talking about, and yeah, it just seems real interesting yeah. that they're trying to yeah. make a new framework using the basically the Hilbert stuff that we work with. Quantum, quantum mathematics is very rich. Right, you, you have uh, a change from a binary probability to a continuous probability, right? So, you know, you know, something that either does or doesn't happen can now be in a superposition state. So, you know, you're dealing with a, a, a richer mathematical structure. Um, the, uh, wait a minute. I, this thought and it's just barely escaped here. Let's see, what was it? You know, you've got, uh, oh, like, okay, path integral techniques. And, um, you know, the path integral was around before Feynman. Uh, he introduced the unitary path integral, but, and showed it gives quantum, but there was a Wiener path integral where uh, you, you had a real exponential. And it's, um, it's basically, uh, the time evolution of the Fokker-Planck equation. So, you know, a statistical evolution. Uh, when, you, um, when you look at probabilities and uh, statistics, uh, there are, um, oh geez, what are they called? Markov processes. So uh, a Markov process is, you know, knowing the state now, you, you can deduce the state at the next time step. Right, so you get this unique evolution. Well, uh, you know, quantum. Right, I've heard of a, a Markov chains. That's what yeah, I'm yeah. That's the, that's the kind of thing. Um, so you know, classical probability theory. Uh, I, and I think I'm using the right term here, but I could be off. But uh, there is this idea of um, this step determining the next step. So you have step by step determination. There, there are non-Markov processes where the next step depends on the history um, in a, you know, in a simple or a complicated way. But if, if the next step of evolution depends in any deep way on the history, then uh, you, you need a different kind of uh, probability theory. You, you need something a, a little more sophisticated to, to say what's going to happen. Um, it, it could be as simple as it higher order differential equation, um, you know, which would be more initial conditions, which is really one way of looking deeper into the past, or it, it may be uh, like a functional where uh, the, the value of a functional depends on all of the values of some function. And, you know, we're, you know, we're a good century and a half now, I'm not quite a century and a half into, uh, using functionals for describing various things. I don't see why they shouldn't be useful for econ and social science and all sorts of things like that, because my next step definitely depends on my whole morning's history, right? You know, I am not a Markov process, uh, but uh, you know, I could be some simple kind of process. I'm not all that complicated, you know, like compared to 
say the quantum state of a rock. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, Alex, I don't know if you saw in the chat, uh, we do have access to it digitally. So if you want to read the preface, there it is. Yeah, I'm downloading it right now. That's really cool. Oh, it's crazy. Oh, I see. Yeah. Here, let me let me see what we've got here. Quantum social science. Yeah. That's the title's a little bit funny though. <laughs> I read that. I thought that was like a like a joke text. <laughs> <laughs> like no. There's no I mean, way. <laughs> yeah. They just didn't they just didn't want to put what's the uh what's the science from the foundation series? They just didn't want to be so aust psycho psycho history or whatever. They just didn't want to be so ostentatious to write that down. But That's it sounds crazy. like I mean, right? Like why if you can't if you can predict what a what a what a mole of gas is doing, why couldn't you predict what a group of humans do? Like there's got to be <laughs> did, yeah. you, did you ever read uh, Asimov's Foundation Trilogy? That was the idea of that one. Um, yeah, that's, that's what this, this is really yeah. a whole science fiction. Have you read that one? Um, you know, it has this thing called psychohistory where, you know, they have this mathematics that, you know, predicts human events, you know, far off. And they, they build this... Uh, well, a very stable society because they're able to anticipate all the things that might disrupt it. And, uh, then somebody's born that has extraordinary uh, <laughs> mental capacity. It, uh, <laughs> things Ruin in book. What's that? Ruin in book two. Oh my gosh. Ruin in book two. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> Sorry. No, the mule. I don't the mule, I'm, no class. Yeah, the mule. Okay. So you know this stuff. Good. Great um, book. Yeah, yeah, that is. That's that's a fun one. Well, I mean, are there any reasons? Like, is there a theory in chaos theory that if you have a chaotic enough system, you can't do statistical mechanics? Or if you had a chaotic enough system that was small enough in another system, you could still do stat mech on it, right? Because I think that's what we were doing with like the, uh, we were doing some studies of nested spin, like the atomic spin. And it's like, if you move fast enough and you're big enough, you don't really care about those oh. <laughs> modes okay. of excitation. Oh, you're gonna cross grain it. Okay. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, okay. So a chaotic system is one where the, let's say, the phase space paths um, for slightly different initial conditions uh, diverge exponentially in those initial conditions. Mm -hmm. So uh, classically, we typically assume that nearby initial conditions lead to nearby evolution. And that, that enables us strong predictive ability, but uh, predictive ability is not necessarily absent with a chaotic system. The problem is that in order to predict, you know, a certain distance into the future, you need to know extremely precise initial conditions. So, you know, be because slightly different paths diverge so quickly um, in order to, to keep the evolution restricted to uh, a small range, you have to very precisely control those initial conditions. And, and you know, we're talking to many significant figures. So, um, you know, it, it, it's still a classical system. There is a there is some notion of quantum chaos too. I can't say a whole lot about that, but uh, it's, um, you, ha you haven't lost predictability except in a practical sense. You know, in, in principle, it's still a classical system. Okay. So. Okay. Well then, uh, so maybe, I mean, then, then, then you, there's almost no, I mean, there's no, if there's no strong reason why there wouldn't be something like psychohistory, then there should be something like psychohistory, right? If there's yeah, no reason well, that humans aren't entirely predictable when they're yeah, yeah. Oh, hey, that's, Guillermo, that's I was going to mention, <laughs> I forgot to mention in class that uh, Aaron and I are going to, and there's a couple undergraduates too, are going to kind of like read a string theory book. And we're not going to do like, like a bunch of, but just kind of like read and do some exercises. And I was going to announce that in class, but I am a space cadet. So are you interested in all? Um, yeah, well, which one? Are, is it, is it, is it, uh, God, what's his name? Daniel Schumer. That's one that I know. Uh, of. We were using the Zweibeck. Zweibeck. Schwebeck book? I don't oh, know. I've never, I've never heard of that book. Schwebeck's good. 
Yeah, yeah, that was Dr. Rodriguez suggested that to us. Um, yeah, but, uh, yeah, I don't good. know if you're in. Do yeah. you think it was good? That's a good one too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, yeah, that sounds good. Uh, yeah, just send you're... me the. Okay. Send me the title, and I'll find a copy. Yeah, I think there's a there's a group drive that Aaron set up that I can even just link you to that has everything. Yeah, that so, sounds good. Um, and we're gonna meet tomorrow at two thirty. So I don't know if you're free, but we'll just zoom. Uh, wire. Uh, through Zoom? Zoom? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds good. Sounds okay. real good. Okay. Uh, cool. I get, well, hold on. What's the reading assignment, though? Uh, we, we're kind of just going to meet. Like, I, I read the first chapter, so it's just like the historical introduction. Oh, so, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of those QFTs have historical introductions <laughs> to the subject. Yeah. So, but, but, yeah, and I think we're going to take it really light, so just kind of you know, no real work and just kind of do it as a reading group, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh yes, do light light reading with QFT. Yeah, oh yeah. Oh, string, I'm sorry. String theory, <laughs> string. Yeah. please. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. What a fantastic <laughs> way to do it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Cool, yeah, it should be fun. So, so I'm gonna go try to post some notes online. Uh, yeah, hey, keep me up on your string group stuff. That, that sounds like fun. I'm not sure I've yeah, got time I'm to sure actually do it, but you know, if you want to bounce questions off me, go ahead. I might, yeah, I might okay. be able to answer. I'll see if I can come up That's with a copy of Sweet Bye. Yeah, more the merrier, absolutely. Um, it, it, you know me, I can't really filter anything, so it'll probably <laughs> find its way everywhere. So, <laughs> okay. Maybe unavoidable, but, but yeah, I, I'd love yeah. to. All right, so I'll see you guys uh, next Monday, if Come not before. Bye.